carry on and plan the sequel. Because let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. Stop! And welcome back to Micro Queers. It's our queer movie review roundup. And I'm Joe. (laughs) And I'm Trace. And we are discussing Stephen Pierce's new queer action horror film, Herd. H-E-R-D. Mm-hmm. Yes, this title is a bit unfortunate. I think it's going to be really hard for people to find this movie. I also don't think it's necessarily, like, an appropriate title for the film. Oh, really? Because it's all about herd mentality. Yeah, sure, I guess. But, like, you know... (laughs) Just call it lesbians. Sure, yes. Uh, Trace, I don't think that's helpful to anybody who maybe hasn't seen the film. So what is this about? Yeah, yeah, everyone. So basically, uh, we have a woman trying to outrun her past, ending up trapped between a zombie outbreak and and warring militia groups. So she must fight to find her way back home with her girlfriend. I'm sorry, wife? I think it's wife, but they don't really confirm. Like, at one point, we see a flashback where she puts a ring on it, but we don't get a marriage sequence. And I was trying to remember if we actually see the ring in the present day. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. But I guess, okay, so right out the gate, Joe, would you recommend Mm -hmm. this movie? I would. I actually... I went into this with very low expectations because it's a random low budget zombie film, but it's actually much more about the militia trying to fight this. And I think the zombies are interesting and it's queer horror. My caveat is that I do think it's a little bit too long. So it's a gentle recommend. Yes, this is a three out of five for me. I actually really like all the stuff between our leading ladies. So this is Alan right. Adair's Jamie Miller and Mitzi Akaha's Alex. Um, and it, I do think the film maybe bites off a little bit more than it can chew when it comes to social commentary and themes with this herd mentality and with Mm -hmm. these militias. It seems like there's a lot going on. But uh, when it's just focusing on our two leads, I really, really find the human component of this story very successful. Yeah. So we learned relatively early in the film that the two women are having some relationship issues. So they're embarking on a five day canoe trip, which is basically fixing the relationship. So if this doesn't work, we're probably going to break up. And over the course of the film, you start to realize, oh, it's because they have suffered a loss in their relationship. And even though Jamie, it seems, was the person who was less invested in having a child, she's taken it really, really hard. But this is also kind of coupled with the fact that she is not over an issue that she's had with her dad since she was a teenager. Mm hmm. Yeah, I didn't love that we opened the movie with her father, Robert, who was played by Corbin Burnson. And... It It's kind of too traditional zombie film where it's like he rushes into his giant warehouse, which is clearly loaded with doomsday supplies. Right. And then he ends up getting attacked by something. And you're like, OK, I guess it's, it's fairly normal. And then you realize over the course of the film, he was a very important person to a number of different folks but for very different reasons. Yes. Although I will say right out the gate, though, I think the zombie makeup, Mm -hmm. if we're going to call them zombies, I think the makeup is really, really, really good. Yeah, it's gross. Everybody's got these big (laughs) pustules. And that, I think, is, A, they look distinct. Like, they were actually giving me a little bit of last for us in the early stages. Mm -hmm. But then over the course of the film, we discover really interesting things about these creatures. So they still have a certain amount of capacity to reason or like they have a rationality to them where they're not just hungry creatures who will devour you. Like you have to threaten them for them to act against you. And most of the time, they just kind of have bad headaches that make them want to scratch their heads against things. Yeah, yeah. And this this is, again, like, we've seen so many zombie films. So I appreciate Mm -hmm. that we're not reinventing the wheel here. But it's something that's different enough. But I think what also helps is that this isn't, like, I wouldn't lead with, oh, yeah, this is a zombie movie. This is very much a, I don't want to say a drama with a zombie movie in the background. Um, Like, there's Mm -hmm. still enough horror components here. But the zombie apocalypse definitely isn't the focus of the film no when i was looking at letterbox reviews of this because i gather it played at a couple of different smaller film festivals Mm -hmm. i saw one person say this feels like a three episode arc of the walking dead that's a little light on zombies and i thought to myself 
that's actually kind of perfectly succinct. Yeah, I, I also don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> no, to be clear, I don't think it's a bad thing either. But it it does have that vibe, right? If you really stretched a couple of episodes, particularly early early episodes of that show where it's just people trying to survive but you know they're zombies on the fringes and really the drama is about how do we survive with this new world order where there's people who think they have an inflated sense of ego and they've got guns and they're dangerous and particularly for these two women what is it like to be closet lesbians when you're suddenly confronted by men who are just like gross well and that's the thing too i mean you get there you get the read of things immediately as soon as they get there because you know jamie immediately is like oh yeah we're, we're roommates we're, we've been roommates forever aka mm-hmm. the good old queer excuse yeah because we okay so one of the issues that i have with the film is that it never discloses where they actually are jamie just says oh we're taking this canoe trip and it's going very close to where i used to grow up which is why her dad ends up playing a factor and they almost you know get shot by this guy named bernie who you know, pauses instead of killing them because he recognizes Jamie. So it's very much a, ooh, we're inadvertently going home kind of narrative. Yeah. But I wish we had have said where we were because this seems like a very astute political commentary about what it's like to go back to a small town that is maybe, mm-hmm. well, <laughs> which is probably homophobic, very patriarchal. And then we've got these two quote unquote city women who have to pretend that they're not together. Yeah, no, it's definitely conservative because I mean, because because Alex even says something at one point where she's like, do, does it matter? Like whenever she says, oh, we're roommates and she was like, mm-hmm. you didn't grow up here. I did. Yep. And so I, I do. I don't think the film is both sides in it, but it does feel very afraid to make a stance on what is essentially a group of hyper conservative uh, 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 doomsdayers. Well, it's tricky. I, I would definitely say it's leaning more left because by the end of the film, when you learn how maybe some of this ends up getting resolved, there seems to be a very firm stance on, oh, these motherfuckers with their guns really jumped to conclusions and they exacerbated a situation that could have been much more easily contained and or resolved. Mm -hmm. But we do have this one character, Big John, who is played by Jeremy Holm, who seems to have a, a better head on his shoulders for lack of a better term and he's constantly trying to rein in all these young dumb motherfuckers who just want to go out shoot things you know like bernie i think is the worst of them all but he also comes out of this mostly scot-free yeah because he has a crush on jamie so that's his uh freedom ticket i guess <laughs> <laughs> sure i guess um also though fun fact the guy that plays big john uh jeremy holm we've covered him before because he is the titular ranger in the ranger oh yeah i mean that's the other thing i i don't know either two of these women but i recognize the actor who plays bernie as well brandon james ellis he's done a, a bunch of one episode arcs on various tv shows so he's definitely Saying he's a character actor is maybe too strong. Right. But there's a number of folks in this film where you see them and you think, oh, yeah, I've seen you in at least a couple of other things. <laughs> so it's not so independent that we're casting people you've never seen on screen before. Actually, funny, the woman that plays Diane, um, Amanda Fuller, I was like, I feel like I know her from something. Um, I, I I don't. But she is in 170 episodes of the Tim Allen sitcom Last Man Standing. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. And like Diane is an interesting character. So basically, uh, after the two women get rescued by Big John and nearly killed by Bernie, we end up going to this small town where we have set up almost like a safe haven. But we're battling a more nefarious looking black ops uh, group, which is fronted by Sterling, who is played Mm -hmm. by Timothy V. Murphy. And it's very much a, ooh, you've got medical supplies. Ooh, you've got food. We're probably going to shoot each other. And Diane and her young son, Andrew, end up kind of getting caught in the crossfire. And I thought this was one of the more interesting moral conundrums that the film presents, which is, you know, we get the impression that Jamie wasn't super psyched about being a parent, but she makes this great connection with Andrew. 
And I love the moment where the film subverts uh, that by having Andrew blow the literal whistle on her and it leads to doom. The way I said run over that fucking kid right now. <laughs> Um, it's I, I, that was a good little subversion though because again it is a nice moment between them whenever she gives it to him it's very like you know oh like adult like talking to a child like they're a child but hey like sure. it's a magic whistle and I love that it came back to bite her in the ass because the rule is don't have kids <laughs> <laughs> well I'm curious so you said that the film isn't quite both sides in it but you kind of feel like it's biting off too much than it can chew and by the end of the movie we learned that not only was Jamie's dad an abusive drunk but that he did not take her coming out very, very well, and he ends up dying, but she still puts the picture of him and her back up when everything is resolved at movies in. And I I didn't like that. It didn't feel earned. Yeah. There's there's something at least I don't know about you, but for me, where it's like, oh, but family matters no matter what. Even if you disagree with them, even if yeah. like they they did something like throw you out when you were coming out. I don't buy into that life mantra. Uh, mm -hmm. it, I think you can cut off family under certain circumstances. Obviously, it's a very personal decision. I choose to read this moment as more so like because her mom's in the picture, too. Mm -hmm. And more so like, oh, she can stomach to look at her dad again because of the ordeal she went through. Not necessarily that she has forgiven her dad for all the things that he's done to her. Okay. Interesting. I mean, I, I may be being too generous there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to say because I don't know that the movie makes it explicitly clear. We do have this moment with her and Big John earlier where he says, I found out how your dad treated you and I chastised him after the fact and said, you know, you should never... You should never overlook a moment to tell someone that you love them and you could have handled it better. And apparently it caused a big falling out between the two men. Yeah. And I really liked those scenes. I actually thought Big John was a fascinating oh, character. Yeah. I, I agree. I thought Big John was great. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it's also because he was more open minded amongst a sea of, you know, local redneck idiots. I mean, that's why like whenever Diane, like, you know, she, uh, uh, Jamie stops her from shooting the guy with the gun and then Diane freaks out. like, ah, and, like blows his head off. And it's like, oh, uh, well. Mm -hmm. And then I guess she got bit at some point, too, because then she's infected. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, we're spoiling quite a bit, so we might as well just go the whole hog tilt way. But sure. uh, I thought it was really interesting, like narratively, creatively. It was such a fascinating decision to say, oh, yeah, we can treat all these infected people. We just needed to give them proper medical attention. But everybody was too fucking busy deciding they needed to be vigilantes and killing these folks that uh, now we've just got these mass graves of bodies. This is something that irked me like immediately when I finished watching the movie because I was like, wow, oh. that was a real easy way to solve all this. Uh huh. But then I was like, oh, wait, that's kind of the point, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like these people with their herd mentality jumped the literal gun and just started shooting people when all they needed to do was trust the fucking science. Like Trace, this is a movie that was made during the pandemic. Yeah. And in some ways I can't help but feel, oh, it is left leaning because it's basically saying, don't just believe things because some fucking guy with a gun tells you, maybe trust the science, maybe do the work. Maybe. <laughs> but no, I, 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 as someone who fully expected Alex to be dead by the end of this movie. Yeah. I, I, I was again, I was kind of like, oh, you know what? Good for them. Like, I, I'm happy that out of all this doom and gloom, like we do get a happy ending for our two characters. Yeah, it's wild because I spent the whole movie, like, as soon as Alex gets scratched, you think, oh, okay, well, now we're going to have the usual queer, yeah. sad story where one of these two people are going to die. And also, I thought Jamie was stupid for not killing her yeah. or cutting her loose earlier. And the movie then says, you know, maybe it is easy. It's a feel good kind of out. But also, I was really appreciative that the queer couple survives and thrives, and we disprove these local idiot rednecks. Well, and again, that's the subversion of the zombie movie trope for me right there, right? Like, how many times does a zombie virus have a cure in these movies? Exactly. Yeah. And it's not, like, super complicated that the CDC had to make in a lab. It's like, oh, yeah, local doctors figured it out because it's just an infection. Exactly. <laughs> 
It's basically so, yeah. a migraine with pustules. On that, I mean, on that note, like, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I liked that about it, but I do agree with you. It does feel a little too long. I think the pacing does drag in parts, but mm-hmm. I would still recommend that. I think this is a solid film. Yeah, I, I wasn't bored. I enjoyed watching this, and it mostly comes together in the end. It's just, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of shootout, gunfire, bang bang yeah. stuff towards the end that I just thought, yeah, we could lose some of this. Yeah, you could. You absolutely could. But hey, you know what? They want to give people their action. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, let us know what you thought of Herd. Uh, this is, of course, now out on VOD and streaming, so you can find it wherever you uh, rent things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, until our next micro queers, whenever that may be, uh, we can cross out Herd. Indeed. And cross out micro queers. <laughs> Atlas Avenue, a long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and non-stop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm.